Hello, everyone, and welcome to SPARE's webinar, Pop-Up Transit, How to Launch a Vaccination Service. It's hosted by myself and my team here at SPARE, and we have panelists joining us from RNV in Germany, City Bus in Texas, and Innovation for Mobility in Virginia. Before beginning the webinar and uh, introducing our panelists, I'd like to encourage you all to participate. You can submit questions through the Q&A uh, chat, or sorry, the Q&A box. You can also participate in the chat. So in the Q&A, we will address the questions at the end. We will also have someone from SPARE addressing the questions to SPARE in real time. And then of course, the ones for the panelists I'll pose at the end. In the chat room, I encourage you all to share anecdotes, insights, your experiences about delivering a vaccination service or a pop-up transit. Of course, we are in the midst of this pandemic and we can all learn from each other. So with that being said, uh, let me introduce the panelists. First, we have Quinn Kleiman, who's my colleague here at SPAIR. Quinn leads the partner success team. And of course, myself, Tanya Castle, I'll be moderating today's webinar. And then we're joined from Ger Germany with Julian Schrobel, who leads innovation and business development for r and in Mannheim, Germany. And then Chris Mandrell, who's the general manager of CityBus in Lubbock, Texas, along with Kelly Coiner, who leads innovation for mobility. Kelly specializes in consulting with trans agencies across North America and looking at the link between technology and transit. You may know her by her moniker of Mobility Mama. So, the first question goes to you, Mobility Mama. Uh, how has the pandemic uncovered uh, gaps in transit, specifically the gap between healthcare and access to it? Well, we already had a mobility gap um, for people getting to healthcare. Um, in fact, having good preventive care, being able to get care that's on a non-emergency basis has long been a challenge. And we've had different kinds of services like paratransit, and we've had um, healthcare providers provide some transportation, but the, the vaccination push to get everyone vaccinated has really highlighted those gaps and underscored some others. And so, you know, a, a good example of that is the same people who needed paratransit or maybe who were seniors who didn't drive still need help with transit. Uh, but there's a whole other group of people who are affected. Uh, think about someone who needs to take off time from work, who needs to be able to get to a vaccination center, or maybe there's someone who's just nervous about a vaccine and doesn't want to drive. Um, there are people who have children that they need to deal with um, as well, and there are uh, many people who um, don't qualify for free transit right now on the fixed route, but who also need, couldn't, couldn't afford to take a taxi or to take some other form. And so all of those sort of underscore those sort of gaps. I think the sort of, um, the, the right now that we, we see people nervous about going and people trying to get there as the vaccine supplies catch up with the demand, we're just gonna see a widening mobility gap unless we come up with some new solutions. Mm -hmm, exactly. The pandemic's definitely brought to the fore the, how critical transit is in nature. Uh, so, so let's bring in our two transit agencies here and how they've uh, addressed uh, this gap and why they've decided to, to address it. So Chris, I'm going to start with you. Uh, it's really interesting because you launched an on-demand program with uh, SPARE at the beginning of the pandemic to address the changes in ridership for your fixed route. And since then, you've run a paratransit service with SPARE, an on-demand microtransit service, and then you decided to also set up a vaccination transit service. Why did you decide to set up a specific service for this? Yeah, so when, when the vaccine started rolling out, um, one of the things that came to the forefront was the uh, equitable, equitable access to vaccinations. And so um, the, city, the city of Lubbock, you know, uh, um, stood up a vaccine clinic through our convention center here locally, and and there was a lot of conversation about making sure um, everybody in the, in the in the city had access to that. And so one of the things that we were very easily able to do in in a, in, in matter of um, days was to um, create a service in our spare platform that was for vaccinations, and and really it's just to provide that equitable access. You know, we um, have some. Um, uh, 
pockets in our community that are um, of the minority populations. And we wanted to ensure that all those populations had the access to get to the vaccinations. We all know that uh, we're, we only come on the other side of this pandemic by you know the vaccinations that are out there. So we wanted to make sure everybody had that, that access to it. We wanted to make sure that people could get to it easily. And so what we were able to do to stand up the new service in, in the spare platform uh, it makes it very easy for people, but it all, all, all kind of stems back to making sure that people had equitable access to get to the vaccination. Because again, it's extremely important to be able to provide that for people. And, and again, we're only gonna get past this the quicker we get people vaccinated. That's absolutely true. And actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna stay with you for a minute and ask you to paint a little bit of the the landscape in Lubbock. You know, what is the transit landscape <clears throat> prior to the pandemic, during the pandemic, and then now? Uh, Texas is probably not known as the most transit friendly of places. So I think it's really interesting to to take a look at that because, of course, then we're moving to Germany, which is a bit more of a transit friendly place. So. Yeah, thanks for that. So, you know, Lubbock is situated out in kind of uh, rural West Texas. So we're, we're kind of right between um, the, the, the Panhandle and the Permian Basin, kind of out, again, out in rural West Texas. And, you know, we love to drive our big trucks down our big roads. Um, that's kind of what we're known for out here is to do that. Um, but in a lot of times, people don't, under, don't, don't think about, and even here locally, we, we have the challenge of people not understanding um, that people still need access to services. And so, um, that when, when, you, when we think about standing up this kind of service to get this equitable access and people um, transported to vaccines, it's not something that came to the forefront uh, initially. Um, it came through a lot of um, just kind of internal discussions and things and, and looking at kind of what the rest of the country was doing as far as um, getting people to, to vaccinations, a lot of talk about it. And so, you know, we, we, the one thing that we like to do here is we don't like to talk a lot about things. We like to do things. And so um, we, we were able to do this quickly, but it was one of those things where people, when we initially kind of um, gave, notify the public that we we're running this. It was something that nobody really ever thought that we would be able to do, or we would be able, or this the community would actually need. And and we've proven through the couple, the, the about a month that we've been operating the service that it is a needed service. In that, you know, people, uh, the people that don't have the big trucks to drive down our big roads, still need equitable access to those vaccinations. Great. And one more quick question: Have you seen an increase in ridership? We have, um, you know, one of the things that we're dealing with here now is kind of the capacity issue and bringing on more capacity to the to the service. But we have seen an uptick in ridership, and it's, you know, as as everything opens up, that ridership is continually going up. Right. Thank you, um, Julian. I, I'd love to hear the perspective of RNV. So RNV actually took a bold move to to launch a a transport program for vaccine eligible residents in Mannheim, even before launching a broader on-demand service, which is slated to come in the weeks or months. Please, please let me know the exact date. How did the idea come about to use SPARE's on-demand transit platform to serve as a, a vaccination transport program? Well, basically, it's, uh, it wasn't that much different from what uh, Chris just told us. Um, we were um, back um, early uh, 2021, we were actually ready to start our regular on demand service with, with uh, the spare system. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic stopped us from doing so. Uh, so authorities and politicians decided it would not be a good time as the lockdown was just extended after the holidays and, and everything in public life was kind of slowed down, shut down. Um, we weren't supposed to start our regular service at, at that time. So we were all set. We were ready to start and we weren't supposed to start at that point. And at exactly the same time, the vaccination campaign started to, to gain crack in, in Germany as well. And uh, we, there was obviously a, a mismatch. There was a, a problem, um, how to get the people there, how the logistics in general would work. And, and we had somehow, we had a solution that wasn't on the market on the streets yet. Um, so... Uh, in, in that specific situation, we, we offered uh, that we might have a solution we can offer and we quickly can adopt and, and, and provide something. So um, yeah, basically all our resources were, were set. We had the, the system, we had the vehicles and, and drivers ready and weren't supposed to, to go out there and, and transport people. Um, and then we had the specific situation that the vaccination campaign started with um, people above 80 and uh, most vulnerable group. And, and there was a central location for, for the, the vaccine center. And obviously the, the question came up, how would people get there? And there's public transport available there. But again, this specific group that has might not, or most many people don't own their own cars. 
um, the, the idea that we might provide, or we, we have the perfect solution actually to provide transportation to those people um, came up and, and was an option for us to, to get started and, and get out there. Great. I'm going to just tack on one quick question here. If you could paint a little bit of the picture of Mannheim, and, and there's a lot of people on the on the, the webinar that are maybe based in the U.S. and are familiar with the more American landscape of transit, but, could, but if you could just quickly paint a picture of Mannheim and sort of your transit system. Well, Mannheim is a, is a city of about a, a less than half a million people, but it's in a very um, densely populated region in the Rhine Valley. So right bordering to the city of Ludwigshafen, where a company called BASF uh, is, is located that might be known to one or the other. Also, the city of Heidelberg uh, is also within our region and very close. So there is a dense um, um, public transport network, mostly on right, light rail and, and uh, buses. But um, in, in the densely populated area, also a lot of car traffic and, and uh, a lot of uh, streets. But um, again, the lockdown, it, it was meant to lower the mobility of people, to lower the, the um, offer of public transport. So there were two situations happening at once. At once, people were supposed to stay and, and don't move around. And at the same time, there was a need for a specific group of people to get to the uh, location of the vaccine center. Perfect, thank you. And that's of course why you decided to launch a vaccination transport program. When we've just heard from both City Bus and RNV uh, about how they use Spare Platform to set up an on-demand, well, a pop-up on-demand transit service quickly and effectively. How does the Spare software allow transit agencies to do this is part one of the question. And part two is what are the steps that City Bus and RNV and other partners of ours go through when they're setting up a vaccine transit service or any pop-up transit service? Yeah, absolutely, Tanya. So, you know, I, th I think obviously the COVID pandemic has, has really uh, pushed community leaders to be, to innovate and, and try new solutions to these, these challenges we've, we've been presented with. And one of the, the largest challenges has obviously been the logistics in, in, Del delivering vaccines to uh, those in the community, especially uh, you know those who may not have a regular access to a, a personal vehicle or may not be able to use uh, a fixed route uh, due to a disability or or some, for some other reason, as uh, as Chris was mentioning earlier. So what we've seen is, is basically two approaches to uh, this problem. Uh, the first one is an expansion of a current service to include vaccination sites. So, so many of our partners already have on-demand microtransit services up and running uh, that you know, may have not included uh, these locations where vaccines are being administered. And so uh, their approach was, let's just expand our service area to include these, these areas. And, and then residents can take our existing transit service to these locations at any time. And these were generally communities that, you know, already perhaps had free fares on the system, already allowed uh, advanced bookings and for riders to book dates in advance and a whole bunch of other characteristics. So for them, it was, it was really as easy as going to the platform, expanding the service area, putting a zone around a vaccination center, uh, and then advertising that both in the app through an announcement and you know through their, their normal communications channels. Another approach we've seen, which uh, CityBus and RNV have employed here, uh, is basically launching new services created specifically for uh, the vaccine center transportation and being able to really customize the configuration and the parameters of the service specifically to that need. Uh, and so there was a lot of different things to consider here. And uh, you know, the first one is, are we going to only allow travel to and from the vaccine centers? Uh, and do we want to allow it just at specific times or at all times of day during our, our normal service hours? So that's the first thing we we've, we've been discussing is we can restrict travel. You know, you can be picked up anywhere and, and then taken to a vaccine center and you can be taken from a vaccine center uh, and uh, dropped off anywhere. But you you know, you can't ride for free, perhaps uh, between any location. A lot of the times we've made these services a free of charge uh, for folks to really encourage them to you know, use it and, and get vaccinated. And obviously everyone in the community is gonna benefit from that. Uh, the next thing we, we really look at is, do we wanna allow pooling? We want this service to be commingled. Is there health benefits or, or regulations, protocols that we need to abide by? So separating folks when they're going to or from vac vaccination centers, uh, do we want one occupancy? Do we want multiple occupancy? What are the considerations around that? 
There's also considerations around restricting to only specific fleets of drivers or vehicles, depending on the health protocols. You know, do we want to use specific vehicles and drivers who have PPE? Uh, do we want to make sure that we are really uh, protecting the most vulnerable? Because generally, right now in the vaccine rollout, those that being are th those that are being transported are. Uh, you know, those that are most vulnerable, uh, folks who, who work in healthcare, folks who work on the front lines, uh, folks in older uh, demo age brackets and, and, and demographics that, uh, you know, are perhaps more vulnerable to the, the virus. So uh, there's considerations around that, which we can do with restricting trips to specific fleets of, and specific drivers of vehicles. There's also questions around prioritization. So uh, do we want to prioritize these trips over others? I know that uh, City Bus has allowed advanced booking for this service. So you could book five days in advance versus normally same day only bookings for the, their, uh, their general public facing on-demand service. Uh, so, you know, those can, who can book in advance, they are given priority or, or over those who are booking on demand. Uh, RNV has also, you know, looked to restrict trips to just those who are eligible to get the vaccine to, to make sure that we're only providing services to those who really need it. And so these, this is, these are further considerations that we're taking. Uh, I just mentioned advanced bookings. So, you know, opening up advanced bookings to, to folks who want to go to and from vaccine centers has also been a, new, uh, a big consideration for those setting up these pop-up services. And then the last, one of the last things, um, there's, I could talk, speak all day about this, but- You got to uh, make this one the last. So I yeah, <laughs> um, app bookings versus call-in only. So, uh, you know, do we allow them to book through an app or do we want to have that extra kind of gate there for call-in only? Um, and then obviously fares and payments. Are we keeping fares enabled or are we providing free fares to encourage people to, to travel to and from these vaccine centers? So uh, depending on the community's needs, we have designed our services and, and obviously completely in partnership with our partners to fit their needs uh, and get them up and running, you know, within seconds. They could do this all on their own if they wanted to, but we've really worked with them to design services that make the most sense for them and their communities. Uh, and then from there, communicate that out to, to the community and really get folks, you know, vaccinated and, and ready to, to uh, move on with their lives, hopefully here. Thank you so much, Quinn. That was a very detailed answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd actually like, to, like to, to dive a little bit deeper, though, because I'd like to hear the perspective from the transit agencies. So Quinn alluded to some of the things you're doing in, in Texas. Uh, Chris, could you, could you talk us through how this service is different from your paratransit service, from your microtransit service? Uh, for example, in booking times, in fares, in safety protocols, really the nuts and bolts of how the service is run and set up. Yeah, so so Quinn stole a lot of that thunder there, but uh, <laughs> some of the some of the protocol, the things that we've done is 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 two two things, two 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 primary things. Number one, we we made this service fare free. We we didn't want that to be any um, hindrance for anybody to get to the vaccine site. Um, so we wanted to make sure in, the, in, in the, 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 the span of making sure it's equitable, we remove that financial barrier, which, uh, you know, hopefully more people will want to take that service to get that vaccine because that's removed. Um, and then the other thing we did is we, we prioritize these trips over our general on-demand boarding. So, you know, we, we are commingling all of our services that we're running, paratransit, our on-demand, um, the vaccine service, we're commingling that. So we're, we're using the same number of vehicles that we've traditionally always used. We're just opening up seats for other individuals on those vehicles rather than them being dedicated to uh, one certain group. And so um, with that, we, we've prioritized the, the vaccine trips over the on-demand trips so that we want to give you know, removing barriers for them, but we want to give them that seat prior, you know, before any other on-demand to kind of really make it um, uh, a worthwhile opportunity for them to get to the vaccine site. So we, we've made it fair free. We prioritize the trips. We allow them to book the, the vaccine trips up to five days in advance. Um, so our, our city clinic that is running right now, the vaccine clinic, they open uh, four days a week, um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Saturday. And, and so those are the days we're allowing them to book those trips five days, five, uh, those, those trips five days out. Um, and so some of there's been some conversation about what happens when, you know, with the, with the, 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 to two shot vaccines, you know, what, what do we do there? Um, there's, there's, we have plenty of room on our vehicles and kind of in the service to make sure that they get those trips, um, back to the vaccine clinic for that second, second one. But, um, we're, those are kind of the things that we're doing. We, we want to make sure it's prioritized. We can't, you know, we obviously can't prioritize them more than our ADA customers, but we want to make sure they are prioritized more so than the general on-demand uh, riders that are there. 
I think there was plenty of thunder there too. <laughs> Thank you for that detail. Um, Julian, Chris had the benefit of already having on-demand services up and running in, in Texas with, you know, through City Bus and Lubbock. So the population was somewhat familiar with, with how it works, the service. It was brand new for, for RNV and in Mannheim. How did you go about discussing how on-demand works with healthcare professionals, with local council, um, and also with your general public, getting the word out there of, for the service? Well, to start with the last question, we, we actually did not get the word out there in, in the general public so far. We will do this in the upcoming weeks as, as we will integrate that service with our regular service that started in March and we will extend it uh, next week. Uh, so we'll bring those two together. But in, in the original setup, it was just um, communicated to eligible people in the priority one vaccination group. So the, the city of Mannheim uh, actually wrote letters to, to all people who are eligible and explaining the way how you get an appointment, how, how this will happen, where you find further information, and also providing information how to get there. Also suggesting, you know, you if you have somebody who can take you or uh, you can use general public transport or you can use this specific service that we offered. So uh, that was not our issue at first because everybody who was eligible got the information that this service exists and this by public authorities. And um, so that was easy on, on that side. So it was more the organizational issues that we had to take care of. Technically, as, as Chris um, and, and Quinn also pointed out, it, it was very easy and, and quick to set up in, in the platform. I mean, it, that was really not the big thing. It were more of the organizational things with the authorities. We have strict regulations on public transports. We had to clarify, can we do that? If so, how, how do we have to do it? What, what regulations do we have to um, uh, take into consideration? And even though even German authorities can be a lot more flexible if there's urgency and, and there's a need to, to uh, current crisis uh, with the COVID-19 pandemic. And then from then on, it, it was more further organization issues with the uh, vaccination center. Where can we bring those people? Um, you know, what, what timing, how many minutes in advance of their appointment should they be uh, there? I also read the question if they drive through. We don't have drive through vaccination centers, so we drop the people off and, and we take them back home. Um, so we pick them up again after um, they, they got their, their shot. And... Um, yeah, so it, it was more practical organization issues of, of getting all this straightened out. And, um, but as I said, in, in this specific situation, even our uh, authorities and, and our stakeholders we were in touch with were quite flexible. And communication was, was done in, in, at once to, to the whole group of eligible people in the city of Mannheim. That's, that's a great segue to my next question to you, Kelly, which is, you know, how do you think the, or what do you think is the impact of pop-up vaccination transit? So perhaps uh, for Julian and Mannheim, it's a greater link between authorities and transit. Uh, have you seen this elsewhere and other impacts um, on people's lives and transit agencies? Kelly? Oh, Kelly, did we lose you? Uh, Julian. I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Okay, there we are. <laughs> Slight delay. Did you catch my question or did you want me to repeat it? I heard your question. Okay, um, I had it on mute because while Julian was worried about his young children being rowdy, I was actually worried about my older children being rowdy. So, <laughs> well, uh, so what I was going to say is that I like to say that necessity is a mother of invention. Of course, I like any Thing that has mama mobility, mother invention in it. But really um, what we've seen with transit agencies is them seizing an opportunity to innovate. And um, one of the things I have found in the, in the years of working on transit is that, um, that the, and, it, and it's no different here with Lubbock or with Mannheim, that the, when, you, when everything aligns, that there's a chance to make it work to meet a need, um, there's there's some some real important things. I think that um, the opportunity to try what you call pop up transit, what others call mobility on demand, um, applied to transit, is just an um, is an amazing opportunity to innovate over time. And one of the things that we haven't talked about is that. 
um, one thing that makes it a lot easier right now is that there's actually funding for these services and it's funding through the Federal Transit Administration, through the Federal Emergency Management Administration, uh, through CARES Act funding that makes it possible to cut through some of the things that stop innovation. It's often not the technology, it's the procurement cycle. Um, and the, the chance to try this and see that it works gives an opportunity to really take a step forward. I think that what we'll see coming out of the use of pop-up transit for vaccinations is first, that we'll have a sustainable model for continuing to get people to repeat vaccinations over time. It's gonna take a long time mm -hmm. to get everyone vaccinated and then we're likely to have to have boosters, but it also um, opens up another, um, another avenue, another way to use um, our resources to get people where they need to go specifically to health over the long term. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Julian, you, given your experience with this program over the last two months, what have been the results so far? What are some of the learnings that you've had? If you could go back and do something differently or multiple things differently, what would those be? And just overall, if you can share some feedback you've had from writers, doctors, other healthcare professional, professionals, perhaps government officials, um, that would help you shape the service as it is now or into the future? Well, overall, we consider it being a, a great success. Uh, first of all, we were out there, we could prove that, that we, can, we can be of help, we can be flexible and we can offer something to uh, the people in need, uh, so to say. Um, but uh, as you said, we didn't have any on-demand experience. Also, you know, we, we set up Spare before, but we were not in, in service before. So we did have a lot of lessons learned on our way, especially with the specific target group. We had call in only, not because we wanted that specifically that way, but technically that was the most logical way that we would get people to actually use the service and, and book the service. So we had to make some adaptions there. Uh, people needed uh, a hotline to be called even before their trip, after it's booked or, or when you know there's anything happened. We had drivers to be positioned at the vaccine center when they're on spare time and waiting. So they could be approached and then could ask, be asked questions because especially people above 80, they, they had more, it took them a little more to, to adopt to such a service that was not known uh, to them before. And um, also the specific situation of, of the vaccination, um, you know, was put some stress on those people. So we had a lot of questions. Uh, we had some issues with uh, uh, local dialect, so to say that uh, sometimes addresses wouldn't be perfectly um, communicated and, and we had some issues, but we could sort that out and, and we found quite flexible solutions um, on our way also. For example, the, um, sometimes there would be some, not complications, but some people would have to stay longer for um, just uh, to be um, under, um, what do you say, to, you know, to see if anything, if anything happens or if any, any unexpected um, results from the vaccination. So we were very happy to use the, the option of flag down booking so that we could book uh, spontaneous rides uh, home for those people. Um, and um, yeah, I, I guess, the, the target group of, of people above 80 was, was the, the biggest um, or the biggest lessons learned that this is a very specific group. They have specific needs. And we did take a lot, um, a lot of learnings from that that we will um, take over to our regular service. I mean, we had a hard time imagining how we would approach this kind of uh, target group uh, with our new service. And, and now we have a lot of positive feedback from, from people who were very happy and, and very um, grateful for for that offer and, and uh, for that service so we reached those people and uh, we have many ideas coming back at us and, and feedback that also um, after the vaccination campaign might not be the first priority anymore uh, but medicare still is and and also doctors uh, how to get their patients to their to their clinics um, that they could book rights for them so many ideas and, and use cases that we haven't had uh, on top of our list uh, came to us uh, that we try to integrate into our regular service. Now, as I said, we will integrate the vaccine center into our regular service now and extend our regular service to, to offer that on top. So to say in the coming weeks, I guess that's it. And, and as I said before, even though, you know, it seems in North American context um, might not be that obvious, but uh, 
that if, if there's a need and there's a crisis that, that also we are able to provide flexible solutions and authorities and, and all stakeholders can come together and actually make something work within days. And, and that was quite a big lesson learned for us um, as well. I'm going to stop here there because that is the most exciting thing. I think one of the things that came out of the pandemic is, is how quickly things can be done when there's a will, there's a way. And we, we've seen this. So Quinn, we just heard from, from Julian uh, you know, about how they launched their service as well as, as, as Chris. Clearly, on-demand transit is a tool within transit agents tool belt now, transit agencies tool belt now. So how do you see it being used in the future and why do you think it's important for this tool to stay in the toolkit? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think the pandemic has definitely brought to the fore the fact that uh, flexible software solutions can add uh, much more value than um, you know, many thought they could previously um, in that they really let you respond uh, quickly and effectively to, uh, you know, different events happening in your community, uh, whether that be delivering vaccines or responding to a natural disaster uh, or, or any other event where you may need to quickly set up uh, a transportation service to really provide equity to the community. Uh, and uh, this is just one example of that. Uh, we had examples even before the pandemic of responding to, to scenarios and being able to quickly uh, build pop-up services with flexible so software solutions. And so, uh, you know, I think even after the pandemic, we'll see more and more of these pop-up services happening uh, for everything from, you know, uh, local sporting events uh, to, uh, you know, responding or delivering uh, meal kits and, and responding to, you know, crises in, in homelessness or, or hunger uh, and, and really being able to provide uh, more solutions of value to communities. So uh, this is just one example. And I, th I think we're only really starting to see the tip of innovation in this space. Yes, I would very much agree. And I would love to hear your thoughts on that, Kelly. You know, we've seen throughout history, crises lead to significant breakthroughs. So what do you think the lasting implications of the pandemic will be on transit agencies? Um, I think that transit agencies um, will hopefully come out stronger um, than they were in the sense of really um, figuring out and being able to provide the essential spine of services that they provide and then be able to add things like um, on-demand service and better integrate across all the different forms of transportation. Um, I, am, I am an optimist. Um, I have to say that a year ago, I said this was the most exciting time um, in transit. Um, more recently, I've said it's the most terrifying time in transit, but I think that, the, that these kinds of tools can make it be, the, be both of those things at the same time. It's, um, I think that being able, we, have, we know that we need to find ways to have more flexible forms of shared transportation. And we know the limits of what a fixed uh, route transit system can provide. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, what the pandemic will do is it will drive us to find new solutions to fill in, to fill in gaps for the new way that we work and travel, but also to uh, make transit available to people who didn't have it before. Mm -hmm, exactly. And Chris, I'm going to I'm going to hand it to you for the last word on this. And what are the lasting implications of the pandemic on city bus? How has it changed city buses transit delivery for you, your community and the future in regards to service setup, data collection, understanding behaviors and ridership, really any insight of where you are currently and see yourself going into the future? Yeah, great question. And so um, I've been, been kind of in, in this my position for about three years now. And, and when I took over, um, if you, you know, really, when I looked up the definition of public transit in the in the, in the dictionary, I saw city bus. And, and that's all we were doing. We were, you know, it was all about fixed route. It was all um, about running a big bus down the street and in the neighborhoods and those sorts of things. And, and what we've done since the, you know, the pandemic hit, we, we had to do what we call the COVID pivot. We had to figure out, you know, the, the our, our services, our, our ridership is ravaged. Um, and we had to figure out something to do. We, we had to cut service and we created bigger service gaps than we already had. And so we had to do something to try to fill that gap as best we can. And so that's when we turned to the on-demand transit. And in and, and pre-pandemic, you know, we were only serving probably 60% of our entire city. 
and, and, and so we had a lot of out kind of the suburb or the uh, kind of the rollish parts of our city that we weren't being served. And so now we got on demand transit and we served the entire city limits, bringing people into work, bringing into vaccinations and all those kinds of things. So um, much like what Kelly said, it's if for, for me and for what we're doing here, it's an extremely exciting time about where we're going and how we continue to evolve our services to kind of to, to, to continue that COVID pivot and to, to continue to provide innovative ways to where we can bring um, solutions to the community uh, and, and can, to solve those mobility gaps. And one of the things, or one of the other things is locally, we're, we're, we've never been really seen as an, uh, an optimal solution to mobility. Um, it's one of the things that, you know, we've, you know, we put buses on streets, but, you know, um, it's never been seen as an, an opportunity for people to to utilize to to meet the needs of their 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 lives and to get to where they need to go. Now we have that opportunity. Um, we're, we're redesigning our fixed routes as we speak, and we're going to figure out how we can, you know, take our on-demand service and match it with our, 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 our fixed routes. We have a large university here. We're looking at, um, you know, taking their routes and, and just a whole, I mean, I could go on for a long time about what this is doing for us, but this is a, a time, it's a really exciting time for us right now. We, we are um, taking this opportunity to really look at our services and how we can be better in the future. Um, and so if, for, for providing mobility for the, our community. And so it's, again, it's, it's extremely exciting about what we're doing here and, and what um, opportunities on-demand transit has allowed us to, um, to get into and, and the things that we're able to do with it. So um, a pandemic for us, it hit and, it, you know, it's, it's never good for that, that it hit, but for us, um, I, I think it was great for us because again, we had to do the the COVID pivot and really look at our services and what we can do to innovate to provide better service to the community going forward. Great, thank you so much for that. So that brings us to the question and answer period. So we've had lots of questions come in through the chat. And actually um, one question we had before going into this, which is open to the audience and please address it in the chat room. We just jumped over that slide real quick was, you know, the question I just posed is what does pop-up transit look like beyond the pandemic? So keep that in mind for yourselves and feel free to share your thoughts in the chat if you like. Um, and now I'll go to the questions. So one of the questions here is, uh, what, are the what are the thoughts of the panelists on taking vaccines to the people? So like a mobile vaccination clinic. Kelly, I think that might be an interesting one for you to take. Um, the, uh, certainly, and I saw, I saw that question, we've seen a little bit of where transit agencies have actually taken testing um, facilities to people using their regular transit buses. Um, what's been kind of more interesting to me is the conversion of charter buses and the charter bus industry is, you know, it's, it's pretty much out of business right now um, where they've converted the buses and they've turned them into moving vaccination um, units so that they can take them closer to a population. It doesn't literally take the vaccine to your door, but it takes it to your neighborhood. Um, and then there's another interesting um, use of taking taking clinics to places that uh, the place in the country that when I checked about 10 days ago, I haven't checked recently, but it had the highest rate of vaccination was West Virginia, where the population is very dispersed. And there they've used um, uh, transit and human service agency assets to take vaccines to people. Um, the biggest challenge is the logistical issue of keeping them cold. Um, so okay. that's sort of sort of a huge range. And then i my state's been the beneficiary of of the uh, experience in uh, West Virginia, and that the southwest corner of the state, which had the highest rate of COVID deaths, um, also has the highest rate of vaccinations. Well, that's, that's a good flip side. Um, I, I've had some questions come in about you know, keeping this service post uh, vaccination service. And, and Julian, you touched on that. Um, Chris, we spoke about this a little bit yesterday. So firstly, Julian, I'd like you to talk about what some of the doctors are asking you a bit more in detail, which you touched on during the webinar. And, and Chris, what we spoke about yesterday is you're using on-demand transit, sort of a pop-up format for school transportation right now and a few other things. So, so Julian and then Chris. Um, well, uh, yeah, I, I touched on it a little bit. You know, we, we realized that there are further needs and then there are use cases that we haven't thought of. And um, we had the feedback 
that you know that doctors would wonder you know I, I need to get patients on a regular base to my to my clinic uh, and the patients need to get there and it's uh, it's not easy accessible so to say if it's not if you don't live on you know the, live on one bus stop so to say or it would be tramway or light rail stop and, and your doctor's on the next stop then then you might have access but otherwise you don't so we we do think that this is a um a big issue and, and we we can serve a, a wider group of people and, and we can serve a need there if we think about those routes that people take and and those um um places people need to get to and and people have a problem to so we want to cooperate with uh, clinics or or we want to get in touch and, and doctors so to say to to offer services that that fit their needs um so we might not make a specific service, but we might enable the, the clinic to book for their patients, or we might uh, advertise the, the option to book your ride, uh, maybe once you, you book your appointment or anything for a doctor or for a clinic. So to keep um, that purpose um, or keep that use case also in our regular service. And as I said, we will just integrate the vaccine center as a regular um, stop, so to say, even though it's uh, outside of all our zones, we'll integrate it into our regular service. So within a few weeks, we hope to just offer uh, transportation to the vaccine center on a regular basis within our regular service. Mm, interesting. And Chris? Yeah, so <clears throat> kind of talking about the, some other pop-up type transit activities we've done um, is, you know, local, we have a uh, our local school district. So they have an alternative school um, that for whatever reason, um, they have a, a their, their school buses, their, their school buses will not serve that, uh, that school. And so they have a, a, a large uh, issue with getting the kids that need to go to the school to and from. And so they reached out to us. And, and so we are working with them um, right now. We've uh, kind of integrated their, those students kind of getting on to just the on-demand service to get them to and from school. But we're working with them to figure out, is there a way that we can help them out in the future just to move those kids to and from? Because, um, you know, there, there are, they're, they're typically anywhere from, you know, uh, elementary through, through junior high type age kids. And so um, they, they can't, we, we, we have a fixed route that runs really, really close, but the, the idea there is that some of these kids, they probably, they, they couldn't trust to make sure they got on the bus and got to the right club, got to, got to school or got back home um, in, in a timely fashion, or if they'd even make it to the school or to home. So um, they really saw the on-demand transit as an opportunity for them to make sure their kids are getting to and from school. And so there's a lot of things that we have to work through with them. And, you know, one thing we don't want to do is uh, get in trouble with FTA and, and, and think that we're providing any sort of school bus service. Um, but, you know, it's an opportunity we have to, to work with the school district to, to provide them the service they need to get the kids to and from, because, you know, ultimately maybe these kids, um, they'll turn into longtime riders or they will, you know, um, through the, the making sure they get into school that, you know, they can turn things around and they can um, to grow to be productive members of the community. So I think there's a lot of uh, good things that can happen, but it all starts with the transportation of these kids to and from their school. So we're working with them. We're, we're very happy about it. And I think that we, there's a, um, a resolution that we can come to and we can re really help them out. I think that's a really great point you made about how you know getting riders early. You know they tend to stay transit riders, and and maybe in, in Julian's case in Germany they're getting riders later at 80 years old or so, and maybe they were afraid at the beginning to take transit, but this was the, you know they they were able to break the barrier, and now they've done it once they can do it again. So these vaccination rollouts and other pop up transit, whether it be school transit or, or whatnot, are a great way to bring new riders to, to your transit service. So, so that's exciting. We're always looking for new riders. Um, quick question I'm, I'm going to pose to you, uh, Chris, again. Have you had any challenges with drop off sites? Uh, you know, is it is it similar to how you do for paratransit, a curb to curb? Or have you had any issues with long queues or long lines at the vaccination centers? It's all of our, the, the one, so right now we're only working with one vaccination, vaccination site and that's the city, um, the city site and they, and everything they do is by appointment only. And so they, um, they, they will have to go on like the, the, the person will have to go online and, 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 and you know, get an appointment, whatever they have available, get that appointment. So um, when we get there, I think originally when they kind of first started op opened it up to, I think phase 1B, um, there were a couple of days where they had long lines, but they've they've totally gotten the system really worked out. I, I give a lot of kudos to the city of Lubbock's um, public health department because they are just knocking it out of the park as far as their organization and the logistics they put into it. But we don't have the long lines, you know, we, we will pull up and the way we've developed the service, um, they've asked us to have the, the individual there 15 minutes before their appointment time. 
we're getting there right there at the 15, maybe, maybe 20 minutes because of the time flexibility we've included in that, but they're getting right to the door. They're getting in they're, and, they're, and they're getting their shot. And then we've, we, we've told the, you know, the public, you know, if your, your return trip book that 45 minutes after your appointment time, that way you can get through the whole process, get your, get your shot. And then you will have that 15 minutes um, that they wanted to observe. And so um, it's worked out really, really well for us. We've had no issues with lines. We've had no issues of, um, you know, making people wait too terribly long to get there. So it's worked out really, really well for us. And, and, and one of the things that we're working with is one of our local supermarkets through their pharmacy is looking at trying to get their pharmacies um, in their, 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 their markets to, uh, to provide uh, vaccines. So one of the things that we're working on with them is that we can open up those vaccines to those grocery stores in these neighborhoods. And basically all you'd have to do is go into the app and type in vaccine. And then all the vaccine sites will pop up right there for the individual and they can select which one they wanna to go to. And that would again be fair free. And we've set these stop zones up around these locations to where it would basically take them right, almost right to the front door. So it's a really, we're getting them from their, basically from their home or wherever they're going directly to the to the vaccine site, almost right at the front door as close as we can get. Great, thank you. We are at time. Uh, we have three questions left. So if the panelists have a couple more minutes and attendees who want these questions answered, I'll ask them. Um, so the first one is to you, Quinn, really quick. How fast can you launch a service, a pop-up transit service? Honestly, overnight, uh, if you all the pieces come together uh, in terms of service setup, that could take uh, 30 minutes an hour to really depending on how many decisions have to be made. Uh, and I think the, the largest obstacles are, are generally just uh, public communications and, and making sure that you have all the pieces together in terms of uh, organizing with the vaccination centers, public health authorities and, and local uh, you know, community leaders. Great. Um, there's a there's a technical question here real quick that I'm going to keep with you also, Quinn. Uh, does spare backdate do time pick up times based on appointments? Yes. So uh, basically what we could do is we have an arrive by functionality. So uh, you can, sorry, the question just disappeared, disappeared for me there. Uh, you can use an arrive by functionality to say, I want to arrive by a specific uh, time. And then we will give you the rider, the pickup time to make sure that they get to their appointment on time. So yes, it's a, a built-in functionality of the platform. Great. And quick last question. Um, uh, I think this would be best to you, Julian, since it's coming from uh, Spain, so the European context. Uh, do you have any experiences with subsidies? So, you know, a partially publicly funded on-demand trip for, for pop-up transit or on-demand transit more broadly? I'm afraid to say that out loud. We, we actually also there, uh, authorities and, and our funders were, or, or the, um, the city of Mannheim, and, and we also have public funds from the federal ministry and from the state level for that on-demand service. And they were all just very flexible and said, yeah, great idea, go ahead and do it. So we do that fully on public funding. We are a public company. So everything we spend is, is public money if one way or the other, depending on come from the city, state or, or uh, level. And we don't charge um, uh, people for the vaccine service, anything that will change once we integrate, we'll use our regular tariff or fare system then uh, but it won't be much um but so yes we we do use public funds uh, for the service basically right now fully publicly funded great thank you so much on that note i'll, I'll wrap things up uh, if your question wasn't answered live i do hope you saw it in the q a answered uh kelly was kind enough to do some some text answers as well as my colleague josh so if and if you have another question that comes up, please uh, email one of us here. Uh, you have contact information on the screen. So we look forward to hearing from you. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to uh, all of our panelists today and, uh, and sharing their time and their insights. And uh, clearly they've been doing a lot of hard work in this space. So, so big congratulations to, to what you've managed to accomplish. And it's really exciting to hear, hear what's coming and all the learnings that this has led to and, and really the new developments uh, that will come out of it. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, you will get a recording. And as I said, reach out if you have any questions, comments, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Have a great day. Thanks, Tanya. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys.